Thank you very much. Uh, magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Nengalaba. Uh, good morning in Burmese. For somebody who supposedly already know, that was a pretty long introduction. <laughs> I've been so exposed now. <laughs> but in any case, I'm so happy to be here, uh, to be back, of course, uh, to see Do uh, Lapai Senro again uh, after having met her when she came over for the awarding ceremony of the uh, last year for the Ramon Magsaysay Awards and uh, um, also be part of a panel with her when she gave her speech at that time at the building of uh, the Ramon Magsaysay Foundation. Uh, I think I remember distinctly the fact that uh, she had by then given up Meta Foundation uh, which she founded. Uh, her baby but uh, somebody who believes that you don't keep, you don't treat institutions as your own baby that you, can, you turn it over to the next generation to, to, uh, to uh, nurture and to, uh, uh, to find its new directions as well uh, in accordance with the changing times. And I do remember the first director of the Third World Study Center, uh, sociology professor Randy Dobby, saying the same thing, uh, that he, after being so associated with the PWC for the longest time since it was founded in uh, the 1970s during martial law when uh, the Don Demenso, the former president of the university was then the dean of uh, what was then a singular college known as the C College of Arts and Science. Uh, but uh, she did give us, that, uh, Professor David did give that up and uh, eventually you have had a succession of directors and now uh, I'm very pleased that the Professor uh, Dr. Jose. By the way, we graduated from the same high school. He's uh, several batches higher than me, but her, his sister is a batch mate and a good friend in Philippine Science High School. So, uh, Chancellor, uh, thank you also, Vice Chancellor, for this opportunity. <clears throat> uh, let me start by saying that uh, what we are finding now in uh, Myanmar, and I'm not an expert anyway, <laughs> by the way. And I think I'm not an expert, of course, somebody coming from the region. I do teach Southeast Asian politics, but actually the last country in Southeast Asia that I visited was Myanmar, precisely because of the conditions that it faced for a long time uh, in the 1990s, uh, late 80s, 90s, and, and so on. But we may say that uh, it follows one type of democratization uh, that we have found uh, uh, from the global experience uh, beginning in the 1970s when democratization became, started to become a fashionable term to describe processes that were going on around the world. And that category is a category where the process itself continues to be led by the regime, the existing regime. It's a regime-led democratization and in this case it's a military regime. You may say it's similar to the experience of Vietnam, but in the case of Vietnam or even China, it's a Communist Party-led process. The opening up of uh, uh, first the economy and later on the political system, a very slow and gradual process, a very managed process, but in any case have prevented uh, serious upheavals that, uh, at least in the case of Vietnam and China, I wouldn't say except for the uh, Chananmen massacre, but I wouldn't say the same for Myanmar because of the so many incidents of violent upheavals that have taken place. But what we can see is that the regime has stayed afloat and that it is managing this kind of, uh, of a transition. Uh, first, with the rewriting, the writing, finally, the writing of the constitution, the finishing of the constitution, which took a long time the finish uh, start with starting way back when the elections election results were disregarded altogether. The constitution of uh, an assembly to draft to draft it and, and so on, and uh, up to the point where in fact the legislature continues to be dominated by the who uh, continues to play to give a, a significant space to the military, about 25 percent of the seats, and certainly most of the the positions, uh, senior positions, beginning with the prime minister, the president, all the other posts are still held by uh, uh, military officers, retired uh, military officers. No, they're actually not even required to, to 
Prieta, are they? Uh, I'm not so sure now. Uh, but in any case, from a military uh, background. Um, so uh, what we have seen is perhaps a regime trying to reinvent itself. Maybe it's a better part of karma to reinvent yourself than to continue ruling the same way that you ruled before. And to that extent, uh, it has uh, managed to see through a process where in uh, very, very small measures, uh, spaces have opened up. Uh, one, of course, for uh, constitutional reform, not significantly enough, but a certain measure of uh, 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 opening up of a legis legislative process where you had, in fact, opposition, including, of course, the leading opposition figure, the, the head of the National League of Democracy, uh, Do, Do Ong San Suu Kyi, getting inside uh, in parliament, and several other parties that have uh, been uh, set up, uh, including ethnic parties, ethnic-based political parties, to, to, to be able to sit in the uh, legislature. And even though such a constricted space as the legislature somehow uh, it has managed to put in place, or at least a process where there is engagement between civil society, for instance, in the crafting of the, uh, the law pertaining to associate associations, the setting up of um, uh, civil society organizations. Uh, uh, I think uh, another law is still in the works with regards to the mass media. Certainly, of course, because the mass media for the longest time we uh, suffered from censorship under a period of uh, military rule and slowly, slowly opening up largely also because of the push coming from civil society itself and certainly also the international community that has guarded this process and continue to play important roles in, uh, uh, in uh, mainstreaming uh, universal, the norms of universal rights and uh, universal human rights, uh, socioeconomic as well as civil and political. So what we have seen, have seen in the last few years are significant steps, including recently the release of political prisoners. So much so that even the international contact, uh, international crisis group has awarded the leadership of Myanmar some kind of an award. You know, the I ICG has always been very, very critical. But, uh, but in the end, it's really this phase of a, ha a glass that is half full or half empty to see where it's going. But certainly from an institutionalist perspective or a critical institutionalist perspective, what we can say is that the institutions are not totally determining the outcome. But certainly that there are other factors that are pushing that kind of space uh, wider, uh, uh, even though uh, to a certain extent their hands are tied, precisely because of the still monopolistic grip of uh, uh, the ruling elite uh, from the military, both in politics as well as increasingly as well in the economy that's been opened, opened up. So, uh, and more recently, from uh, my own uh, interest, is the, the renewed initiative uh, to revive the ceasefires that were forged way back, but uh, some had not worked at all, especially with regards to the Kachin region, where some of the more recent violence had continued, and also to uh, restart uh, negotiations with the different ethnic groups, but still trying to figure out exactly how, uh, how to uh, you know, how to manage the fact of diversity, manage the fact of diversity, and the different groups themselves also trying to figure out uh, to what extent they can trust this process uh, for them to be able to achieve uh, that kind of uh, negotiated settlement such as what we have been, we have had managed to do, we have managed to do with uh, our own armed conflicts, particularly with the uh, Moro Islamic uh, Liberation Front. And uh, on that point, uh, let me say that most of my recent exposure to Myanmar actually had to do with these processes um, uh, through the initiatives of different international NGOs. I finally was able to visit Myanmar maybe uh, some three years back on a rather high-level visit uh, by virtue of my current position in government. Uh, uh, together with uh, the negotiator of ACHE for the ACHE peace process, the Indonesian negotiator 
at that time, uh, at, that, at that time, the Department uh, Minister of Justice, uh, Dr. Hamid, and the Vice President, former Vice President of Indonesia, Yusuf Kala, and on our end, uh, Secretary Deles, who heads the Office of the Presidential Advisor on this process, and myself, sitting together with the ministers, Bur Burma, Myanmar's ministers, who are who were tasked to see through the different negotiating table. So at the time, it was the Minister of Transportation transitioning to a new role, and uh, several other ministers of state uh, who were sort of the collective working on, on the peace front. And that kind of engage, engagement, uh, of course, allowed us uh, to share our experiences with regards to our approach to the negotiations with the MLF uh, on Indonesia's side with regards to their approach to uh, the negotiations with uh, the Free Aceh Movement or the GAM in Aceh in, in, in Indonesia. Several other engagements followed uh, through, again, brokered by uh, uh, international NGOs. There was the Oslo Forum, which uh, is held regularly in Oslo, where different uh, uh, first track actors are uh, brought together. And again, uh, uh, that allowed us to formally and informally engage with uh, your leaders. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, these kinds of uh, interface are certainly part of uh, uh, the process that opens up minds and hearts uh, towards more meaningful resolution. I remember distinctly because at the Oslo Forum, uh, there were not only the leaders involved, there were some very key people uh, working in some of the states, like uh, a woman who has long been involved in uh, uh, civil society in the one state, uh, sharing, uh, sharing an informal event inside a boat on the seas of Norway uh, with the number two military general of, of, uh, of, uh, of Myanmar. And, uh, you know, we had to get our food downstairs and when it was announced that strawberry was available, he went downstairs and then came up and offered his bowl of strawberry to the Mon woman. Unthinkable, maybe even just five years ago, that a general would actually even serve somebody who's known to be more or less on the progressive side of, of things. He actually even forgot to bring a spoon and had to go down again to get a spoon. <laughs> But in any case, that kind of interface and uh, the pressure from below, the pressure for, from the international community, the international norms that have guided or are also being introduced mainstream into the, this uh, democratization process, very slow, not a straight path, as in most democratization processes, never a straight path, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of crooked turns here and there, a lot of challenges and crises still to be faced in the future, but uh, to a certain extent already there and can uh, uh, probably not, not be brought back to what it was before. What is what it was before, certainly not before 1988 or even not before uh, 2007, which was the biggest recent upheaval where again, uh, ex with the exception of the recent events involving the Rohingyas. Uh, but previously, for the, the kind of civil political democratic movement, the most significant incident uh, having taken place in, in 2007. Now, over the last few years also, we have been visited by the different uh, activist groups at our office, from the Chins, the Mons, uh, the Shans, Kachins as well, who have wanted to learn about our, our, our process. They've come to Cotabato City, met with our ceasefire committee because as you know they've had ceasefire but we've uh, ever had several ceasefires uh, uh, with uh, the government uh, different distinct ceasefires across the different uh, ethnic groups but uh, with not enough guarantees for the kind of infrastructure you may say a very developed infrastructure as we have here in the Philippines with regards to our ceasefire with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and we, in the case of the Philippines, we have uh, what we call the CCCH, or the Coordinating Committee for the Cessation of Hostilities, and it has its uh, secretariat that works very well coordinating with each other. Uh, down the ground below, where we have our local monitoring teams, and it is also supported by a third party, uh, the International Monitoring Team, 
so this, the, the three parties, uh, the MI, the government, and, uh, and uh, the uh, INT headed by Malaysia, uh, are able to prevent hostilities or address critical, critical uh, incidents in order to prevent uh, uh, further breakdown or uh, uh, the, spread, the spread of uh, greater trouble which has happened every, every now and then, although for the more recent, most recent years we've had actually zero hostilities between the government and the MLF. And to that extent, our model of a ceasefire, uh, the infrastructure, the terms of reference, the guidelines, and the approaches that we have adopted is now serving as some kind of uh, uh, a lesson or an inspiration to the other ceasefire. Uh, to the other groups in Myanmar who are still trying to see to it that they will have a very well managed ceasefire and not just a ceasefire that is more or less uh, lopsided in favor of uh, in favor of the uh, the government or the regime. Um, then, in more recent uh, times, uh, they have they have also been increasingly interested on the nature of the political settlement itself. Because after all, the ceasefire is not for itself. The ceasefire is just, uh, it is basically to provide a good environment for the, for the resolution of the, the political issues, the political, social, cultural issues that, that founded the, the country. And to that extent, a lot of learnings uh, are also now being exchanged with regards to the terms of the political settlement that we have in our case, signed with the Moral Islamic Liberation Front. As you know, we have had, uh, we have finished uh, five and a half documents that will would effectively complete the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro, starting with the frame of agreement which laid down the general parameters. And last year, uh, the documents on the transitional arrangements and modalities, which is the roadmap, how to get to the new Bank Samoro political entity the power shift annex, which is a very important agenda also for the different ethnic groups that really want a more genuine kind of a federal system in, uh, in Myanmar because they have a federal system for the longest time but it's not exactly uh, what you would expect in terms of uh, that kind of uh, uh, meaningful autonomy for, for the different states that make up the the different ethnic, uh, the ethnic states, ethnic, ethnic regions. Um, um, then the Annex on Wealth Sharing, which talks about fiscal autonomy, is certainly also important in any, any arrangement for autonomy or to that extent uh, federalism. Uh, finally, normalization, which we signed in January, uh, the matter of security, combatants, weapons, uh, reconciliation, and healing. So I think uh, we could. Uh, it's only in this means that I have kept abreast with the developments in Myanmar, not to mention uh, the fact that uh, I, we, we have, uh, I have learned about your work in uh, META and uh, certainly gave me new hope with the recent exposés in PETA and, uh, and so on. Gave me hope or gave, gave back to me my faith in civil society organizations NGOs, at least the, the ones that are really uh, working for reforms and not those who are tra just trying to make money out of this, uh, this uh, uh, mechanism that we have called civil society organizations or, or NGOs. Uh, uh, I think I will end there. Uh, a lot of uh, things can still be addressed. Uh, I think uh, for in more recent times, we have been quite alarmed at the kind of violence that has taken place, communal violence that has erupted in, in Myanmar with regards to uh, uh, the Muslim community, the Rohingyas, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the religious, national, religious ethno-nationalism that has also uh, seeped in among uh, the majority population. We all know that uh, uh, Religion, once it gets into the political plane, becomes extremely very difficult and dangerous. And to that extent, most of the matters pertaining to interreligious, intercultural relationships should certainly be managed at the cultural and social level and be prevented from becoming such a volatile uh, political, uh, critical issue. And uh, I hope, I, have, I do not have a good assessment of exactly why this is happening. I've heard accounts 
from different people as to why it is happening, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, we they need all our help that it not it did not get any worse than it is right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear. Yeah, uh